A quick explanation of the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. We'll keep this story as simple as possible, avoiding some of the nuances, although the Septuagint is actually a fascinating and rather complicated story. In broad strokes, we need to begin with the composition of the Hebrew Bible. At some point between, let's say, the 13th century, the putative date of Moses, and more likely the 8th or 7th or 6th century, the Hebrew Bible begins to be composed. And so we get books like Genesis. In the beginning, God made the heaven and the earth. In Hebrew, Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz. That's what it'll look like if you buy yourself a Hebrew Bible. But Hebrew is originally written without vowel pointing. So that's an entirely consonantal text. And the little dots in line two are the vowels which were added at a later date to clarify uh, how to vocalize the text, how to pronounce it. That will become an important part of the story in a little bit. So at some point, the Hebrew Bible is composed, begins to be composed in, in bits, bit, book by book, and of course it gets copied. Scrolls get copied. And then copies are made from those copies. Now, the Hebrew scribes showed a remarkable degree of care in, in copying the Hebrew text. And from whatever time these first books are written, put here the 10th century just as an arbitrary date, perhaps more likely the 8th or whenever, a long, long time ago, the Hebrew Bible gets composed. Before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the oldest copies we had of the Hebrew text were medieval copies. What was remarkable is that when the scrolls were discovered in 1947, for, to a great degree, the texts in the scrolls, a thousand years older than the previously held copies, were often letter for letter the same as what we had in the 12th century texts, the medieval texts. So on the whole, although a text is copied from a text and so on, and we all know that errors can creep in, on the whole, the text of the Hebrew Bible was carried out with great care. And we have something, in most cases, pretty close to what was written a really long time ago, which is a remarkable feat. We're not talking about Hebrew text criticism, so we will keep the story moving forward. Why do we get a Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, and when? Well, the next story is Alexander the Great conquering the entire Near East, from Macedonia in the center of your map, eastward through Asia Minor, all the way through Iran, into India, and south through Palestine and Egypt. And the important thing for our story is that that meant Greek became the lingua franca of Alexander's empire. So Jews, even some in Palestine, in Israel, began to use Greek. And in Egypt, where there was a large Jewish population, Jews spoke almost entirely Greek. And that means that while Hebrew Bibles were being copied, in the third century, the Hebrew was translated into Greek. According to the legend, the oldest version of which is in a book called the Letter of Aristeas, the emperor uh, of Egypt wanted to build his library at Alexandria, the greatest library in the ancient world. And he said, I heard the Hebrews have a really important book. Let's get a copy. Let's get a translation made. So they sent to Palestine and had 72 wise men come down, first in all sorts of wisdom, and in the more expanded version of the legend, these translators were put in separate cells. They each took the Hebrew scrolls and made their translation, and on the same day they emerged from their separate cells, they hadn't been allowed any communication with each other, and all 70 or 72 translations were exactly the same, word for word, which showed that God had supervened over this translation, had approved of it, and had ensured that it was made with, essentially, a form of inspiration. The symbol for the Septuagint, which you'll see most often, is LXX, that is the Roman numeral for 70, because of the legend of there being 70 translators, or again, sometimes in some versions, 72 translators. So, we now have Hebrew copies being made and Greek copies being made. So at the same time that there's Hebrew copies, there are Greek copies. 
what kind of care was shown with the Greek copies. Now we need to introduce a bit of complexity to the story. We need to say a bit about Hebrew, the Hebrew language. So we'll go back to the fact that Hebrew is written without vowels, and we'll put up two Hebrew words, and I'll show you why in a little bit why I picked these two Hebrew words. This is the verb yirshu, it means to possess. And this is the verb yidrashu, it means to pursue. You can see that those two words look quite similar. They differ only in a single consonant, and the consonant is shaped quite similarly, in fact, all the more so in ancient Hebrew handwriting. So the word on the left means possess, the word on the right means seek. All right, this is, we're, gonna, we're gonna focus on a quotation from the book of Amos. So let's imagine originally in the book of Amos, in the eighth century BC, Amos writes, Yershu, they will possess. And that gets copied into some Hebrew manuscripts as Yershu. But it gets copied into other Hebrew manuscripts accidentally as Yidrashu. Those similar yellow letters get confused. When the Septuagint gets translated, what version did it use? Well, if it used one of these Hebrew texts which said Yidrashu, or even if the translator simply misread Hebrew which said Yirshu, he's going to have in Greek the word seek in this quotation from Amos. And that's going to get passed on through copies of the Greek. At the same time, Greek translators, despite the pious legend that they all sat down and did this at once, and the books came out exactly the same, occasionally corrections are made to the Greek, and someone says, you know, I want to have another look at the Hebrew. So periodically, someone will have another go at the book of Amos, and will use a Hebrew manuscript that has Yershu, possess. So you have Greek manuscripts that say possess and that say seek, and you have Hebrew manuscripts that say possess and that say seek. By the first century, there are a variety of readings in Hebrew as well as in Greek. There's multiple manuscripts in different places. Judaism is a trilingual community. They're using Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. For the most part, we're gonna leave Aramaic out of this story because it just complicates things too much. So the question then is in the first century, when the New Testament is being written, when Christianity is having its, its origins, and you have Christian leaders citing scripture, what was in their Bible? When James steps up at the apostolic conference in Acts 15, and he settles the controversial issue of including the Gentiles in the people of God, and he cites this passage from Amos, is he reading a Hebrew Bible, or a Aramaic Bible, or a Greek Bible? And if he's reading a Hebrew Bible, does it say possess or seek? Let me just illustrate why I've chosen this example by looking at James's quotation. James settles the question of what to do with the Gentiles by quoting Amos 9.11. In the Hebrew, the passage reads as follows. God says, In the end times I will raise up the booth of David, which has fallen. Why will I restore Israel's fate? Why will I raise up the house of David? so that the house of David, the Israelites, may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles. That is, God promises, I'm going to restore Israel's fate so that they take over the world. They take over Edom, their old enemy, and they possess the Gentiles. Well, that doesn't look like a very promising quotation for James to use to settle the question of, can Gentiles be part of the people? But that's not the version James quotes. James stands up and says, Brethren, what the Holy Spirit is doing agrees with the prophecy. As Amos said, and here's what James says in Acts 15. Amos told us, I will rebuild the booth of David, which has fallen, in order that all the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles. Well, that's beautiful, and that sounds like Amos was predicting there would come a time 
when all of mankind would seek the Lord, even the Gentiles. But as you can see, that's not what the Hebrew text, as we have it, of Amos says. So how did James get the rest of mankind and seek instead of the remnant of Edom and possess? Well, the word possess and the word seek are very similar in Hebrew, Yershu and Yidrishu. And the remnant of Edom and the rest of mankind are identical in a consonantal text. The only way those would look different is if you add the vowel points and make Edom different from Adam. Edom is Edom and Adam is mankind. So you can see that something as ostensibly dry as textual criticism and how there came to be a Greek Septuagint, a translation of the Hebrew, and multiple Hebrew versions, multiple Greek versions, could have an impact on something as seminal as should the Gentiles be included in the people of God. We can give a couple other illustrations of ways in which the Septuagint made renderings of the Hebrew, which were not exactly inaccurate, but which were uh, not an obvious translation of the, of the Hebrew, and which were theologically significant in early Christianity. So one of the most famous ones is the prophecy from Isaiah chapter 7, where Isaiah predicts that the present political crisis facing Israel would be solved and God would give a sign. The sign would be a young woman would have a child, the child would be named Emmanuel, and before this child is old enough to know good from bad, the problem will be solved. In other words, within the next three or four years, the solution will be, will, will be taken care of. That's the sign. The Hebrew word for young woman is Alma. It does not mean a young woman who has not been married or is a virgin. It just means a young woman, some specific young woman. But the Septuagint rendered Alma Parthenos, and that word does mean virgin. Therefore, it sounds like a prophecy about a virgin birth. Behold, a virgin will be with child and will bear a son. And that's exactly, of course, how the New Testament and the early Christians took this prophecy. Matthew quotes it and says, Jesus was born of Mary, who was a virgin. This was to fulfill the prophecy. Well, you can imagine that when Christians parade this pro prophetic fulfillment, there are going to be Jews who say, wait a minute, that's not what it really said in Hebrew. And sure enough, we not only know from the dialogue of Justin Martyr with Trypho, that Trypho the Jews said, that's a bad translation. But in, in the second century, a Jewish scholar named Aquila made a fresh translation of the Septuagint. And he said, look, we've got to make this more literal. And he said, Parthenos is not the right way to render Alma. Nianus, we need just a word that represents young woman. And there's Aquila's virgin, vir virgin. The Lord will give you a sign, a young woman will be with child. And Aquila goes through the entire Bible and renders it sort of letter for letter, hyper-literalistically. Uh, and that's another story. It's quite an interesting translation. But we'll focus here on a couple other instances where there are translation issues that became theologically relevant. I'll give two more. Psalm 40. In the Hebrew, the psalmist says, God, you don't desire sacrifice and offering, but you have given me an open ear. That is, you've, you've given me an ear to hear you, God. What you want is obedience on my part, and I thank you, God, for opening my ear. Something like that is the message. For complicated reasons, the Septuagint ends up with a text that says, sacrifice and offerings you do not desire, but you have prepared for me a body. Now, that obviously is not at all what the Hebrew says. And in this case, the book of Hebrews takes the psalm as what Christ said when Christ entered the world. That is, Hebrews takes this mistranslation, makes it the words of Christ, and applies it to the Incarnation. When Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you do not desire, but, God, you have prepared for me a body. 
there is a case where uh, an accidental mistranslation led to kind of a major theological idea for the author of the book of the Hebrews. Namely, it refers to the Incarnation. We could do this all day. I'll just do one more. Um, Psalm 116 in the Hebrew, the psalmist says, I remained faithful even when I said, I am greatly afflicted. That is, I did a little bit of whinging. I said I'm greatly afflicted, but I remained faithful when I said that. All right, that makes sense. The Greek is a tad different. It says, I believed. That's kind of like I remained faithful. And instead of saying, even when I said and going on with the quotation, it punctuates it differently. It says, I believed, therefore I spoke. Well, that's not a terrible translation, but Paul will then quote this passage from the psalm in the Septuagintal form as being some sort of lesson about faith and speech. And so Paul says, we have the same spirit of belief as Scripture says. I believe, therefore I spoke. So we believe and we speak. Well, none of Paul's point there, and I'm not entirely sure what Paul's point is, none of it would have gotten off the ground with the Hebrew version. I remain faithful even when I said I'm greatly afflicted. We could do this all day. Uh, I don't want to give the impression that the Septuagint is wildly different than the Hebrew in each and every case. On the whole, for great stretches, the Septuagint would read like a fairly straightforward translation of the Hebrew. But there are a good number of passages that are different, and there are chapters that are in different orders. There are psalms that are divided differently. And occasionally, the Septuagint didn't know what the Hebrew said, or it made some theological adjustments, and those ended up feeding into the Greek Old Testament that early Christianity used as the soil out of which Christian theology grew. And this takes us from a theological issue, uh, from a translation issue, to a theological issue. Namely, between the Hebrew Bible and the Septuagint, What's the authority for early Christianity? This was a question they had to wrestle with as they were mostly Greek speaking. They were naturally inclined to use the Septuagint, but when they were entered into debate with Jews, Jews increasingly drove them to the Hebrew or made new translations of the Hebrew like Aquila and the other Jews did the same thing and said, you guys are basing your theology and your prophecies and so on on bad translations. Now, if we ask the question, what's going to be authoritative for the church? Obviously, the Hebrew's got to be authoritative at some level, right? I mean, after all, that's the original language. Early Christians know that. They're aware of that. And surely, if God gave this text to God's people, that remains an authoritative text. Now, it gets complicated, of course, because Christians increasingly accept the authority of the New Testament. That is, the letters of Paul and the Gospels and Acts. Okay, so we're going to use the Hebrew Bible and we're going to use the New Testament. But of course, the problem is the New Testament uses the Septuagint. And it uses the Septuagint more than it uses the Hebrew Bible. That is, there are clearly quotations that agree with the Septuagint against what the Hebrew says. And as Christians increasingly recognize that the Septuagint does not represent a good translation, are they going to put a check mark by the Septuagint? Is it authoritative? Well, if the apostles used it, then shouldn't Christians use it? We see this controversy come to a head when in the fourth century, Jerome makes a Latin translation, which we have today as the Vulgate. Jerome translates the Greek of the New Testament, that's obvious, but when he sets about to translate the Old Testament, he looks at the Greek, he looks at the Hebrew, and he says, you know what, I'm going to have to go with the Hebrew, because the Greek is just a lousy translation too often. And that ruffled feathers, because it raised the specter of the apostles using the wrong Bible, because they used the Septuagint, or it appears they used the Septuagint. And Augustine actually says to Jerome, Look, I know the Septuagint isn't a very good translation of the Hebrew, but if it's inspired, and of course Augustine believes the legend that 70 translators were separated and 
by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, arrived at a perfectly consistent translation. And for Augustine, God spoke twice in the Old Testament. God said something to the people of God through the Hebrew Bible, and then God said something again through the bad translation, but inspired words of the Septuagint. And so if the New Testament wants to use the Septuagint, that's fine. That's an inspired text. And the church should use the inspired text of the Septuagint. And if you're going to translate into Latin, you should use the Septuagint, not the Hebrew. We don't need to solve this problem, but I just want to raise those issues because as we look at Paul's use of the Bible, it will be the Septuagint that he mostly uses.